Mr. Arne Gunderson is the co-author of the first edition of the United States Department of Energy's decommissioning handbook. He has had over 40 years of nuclear power engineering experience, and at one point he was coordinator for projects in more than 70 nuclear power plants in the United States. He's come from the dark side. His colleague, friend, and wife, Maggie Gunderson, is also with him part of the Fairwinds Associates, which provides information and consultation on nuclear power and nuclear radiation in the United States and, as of today, Canada. Please welcome Arne Gunderson. All right. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. I wish I could be there in person, but this is the next best thing to being there. Today, I wanted to talk about the, the Fukushima Daiichi disaster and compare it to Chernobyl to try to give uh, you as physicians an idea about how the two disasters compare. Just about to this moment, one year ago, I, I was confident that the Fukushima reactors were in a meltdown. Now, that doesn't mean I'm clairvoyant. I'm sure when I look at the NRC transcripts that the NRC knew as well that a meltdown was occurring just about this time. That's not what they told us, though. So I'd like to open today with a suggestion that we all take a moment and honor several thousand very brave men and women at the Fukushima Daiichi plant, as well as the Fukushima Danai plant, both of them almost had meltdowns, and of course, three units at Fukushima did. But were it not for those several thousand people, Japan would be cut in half, and the um, nation of Japan would no longer exist, and likely, certainly Vancouver and the West Coast w would be very, very contaminated as well. So I think we all owe a debt to those several thousand people who risked their lives today and for the next week or two a year ago to save the plant, to save the nation, and, and likely to save the world. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to thank just briefly the translators for the Fairwinds website, as well as the Fairwinds team led by my wife Maggie, who is the, um, the, the brains behind this outfit. Now let's get on to the, uh, the topic at hand. It was pretty clear that the Mark I containment had a long, long history of problems. Those problems include uh, the containment that was too small, it's been known for 40 years, hold down straps that were added after the fact because engineers thought the forces would be down and it turned out they were up, venting of the containment because of hydrogen buildup, which engineers never ever anticipated. As a result of all this, um, Maggie and I were walking about three weeks before the accident and we uh, Maggie said, you know, where do you think will be the next nuclear accident? And I told her, I don't know where, but I do know it's going to be in a Mark I containment. And, of course, the Fukushima reactors were a Mark I containment. So there was that piece, the technical piece. But then, in addition, there was the geologic piece. And also, for 20 years at least, serious scientists in Japan knew that the tsunami risks were being underestimated by the Japanese government. Even eight days before the accident, Tokyo Electric was convincing the Japanese government that there really wasn't a tsunami risk and they needed to study it more rather than build the seawall higher. So this wasn't an accident. This was an accident waiting to happen for at least 20 years and likely 40 years. It's interesting because in the heat of the battle, one day into the accident, Someone on an NRC conference call blurted out, this is the worst containment in the world. So while the NRC has been telling people for years that this containment is just fine, when push came to shove on the day of the accident, they clearly knew otherwise. The accident started with an earthquake, and there's a, the myth of a, sh of a safe shutdown. When a nuclear plant shuts down, it really doesn't shut down. 95% of the heat goes away when the control rods drop in, but 5% remains. And that's because the nuclear fission has stopped, but all of the fission products, all of the pieces of uranium remain radioactive, and that's the problem. Even when the reactor stops, 
the heat does not stop. So for a plant like Fukushima 2, that's about 200,000 to 300,000 horsepower that has to be gotten rid of in a room about the size of a small bedroom. I think it can imagine the heat problem. Well, when the earthquake occurred before the tsunami, clearly there was already a problem in Unit 1 because radiation levels were increasing inside the building and at the fence posts even before the tsunami hit. The tsunami. Well, when the tsunami hit, I'm sure you've all heard that the diesels were flooded and they were unable to get electricity into the large pumps required. We call that loss of off-site power and then a station blackout. Engineers thought a blackout would occur, maybe last for two or three hours, and they put batteries in that lasted as many as four or five, six hours. Well, the batteries began to fail also. So by this time a year ago, I knew the batteries were failing, and that meant that a meltdown was inevitable. When the fuel begins to get hot, the fuel rods begin to crack, and that lets out noble gases. And if you remember, noble gases don't react with anything. So at least three nuclear cores worth of noble gases were released within, oh, certainly within 12 hours of the accident beginning. As the fuel gets hotter still, the zirconium clad begins to ignite. It burns in water. It strips the hydrogen away from the oxygen atoms and becomes zerk oxide, creating hydrogen. Well, that hydrogen gas builds up, and the containment fills with hydrogen gas. It was never designed for this. At this point, clearly heroic efforts of the staff were required the valves that were designed to vent this containment couldn't be opened because they needed electricity. And men went into high radiation areas in the dark and opened valves to begin to relieve the pressure. They were not completely successful. The pressure in the containment began to increase, and what that means is that the containment began to leak. Not just through the vents that the men tried to open, but the Literally, the bolts that hold the containment together began to, to grow with the pressure and release hydrogen into the surrounding buildings. At that point, all it took was a spark to ignite the buildings. Slide 7 shows Unit 1 exploding. It was less than the speed of sound. That occurred on the first day. That was a hydrogen explosion because the containment didn't contain. Slide 8 shows Unit 3 exploding a dramatically greater explosion that literally went up as high as 3,000 meters, and the speed was much faster, and the building is totally destroyed. Slide 9 shows what appears to be an intact building at Unit 2, except you'll notice the box in the front of the building with steam coming out. That shows that there was an explosion internal to the building. While the building is intact, the containment was breached, that steam should not be coming out the side of the building. So we have three containments that were breached from internal explosion. Slide 10 shows Unit 4. Unit 4 had no fuel in the nuclear reactor. It was all removed into the spent fuel pool and is, in fact, the most dangerous of the four on site. It blew up, and there's lots of competing theories about why, but the key is it blew up. This is the reason that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission told the um, Americans within 50 miles or 80 kilometers to evacuate. The nuclear fuel in this reactor, Unit 4, didn't have any containment around it. And if it were to burn, Brookhaven National Laboratories has estimated that 186,000 people would die of cancer relatively quickly after the building caught fire. This is the building today that could still cut Japan in half if there's a major seismic event. There's several lessons technically that we can learn from the first week or two of the accident. The first is the inadequate design bases. And what that means is that as engineers and scientists, we didn't anticipate the worst that Mother Nature could throw at a plant. The next one is seismic problems. Unit 1 failed before the tsunami got there. That's an indication that seismic analyses need to be modified. The next one is loss of an off-site power. And 
together with loss of the ultimate heat sink. Those two occurred when the tsunami hit, the, the diesels were flooded, and more importantly, and this is not even discussed yet, and should be because it affects the Canadian reactors as well as reactors worldwide. The pumps along the ocean that cool the diesels and that cool the nuclear reactor were destroyed. So even if the diesels had survived, there was no way to keep the core cool. It's called loss of ultimate heat sink. Here in the States, the NRC is studying it, hasn't done anything about it, but it is the most serious global issue relating to this incident. We all know that the Mark I containment was inadequate and that venting was also inadequate. Well, I wanted to use most of this presentation's time to compare Chernobyl's releases to Fukushima's um, releases. It was clear to me that on the second day of the accident, Fukushima was as bad as or worse than Chernobyl. We call that a level seven, which is as high as the scale goes. Now, there's some differences. The Chernobyl release was um, a single reactor, and it lasted for less than two weeks. The Fukushima release was 10 nuclear reactor cores. Now, what do I mean by that? We had three nuclear reactors that were operating, and we had about seven nuclear reactor cores in their spent fuel pools. So 10 nuclear reactor cores potentially could release radioactivity into the environment. Chernobyl stopped releasing after about two weeks. And of course, now we're a year into the, the Fukushima accident, and it is still releasing radioactive material. Well, the key for this accident, the Chernobyl accident, and also Three Mile Island, is that no one measured the releases. At Three Mile Island, all of the radiation detectors were designed only to detect low-level radiation, and they were destroyed during the accident because the radiation levels were so high. At Chernobyl, the explosion exceeded what the instrumentation was capable of, and also, of course, the radiation went out beyond where the instrumentation was. And at Fukushima, the electricity that powers the radiation monitors failed, so no one knows on a hour-to-hour -hour or minute-to-minute -minute basis what Fukushima release. But the releases come in four different categories. There's noble gases. The noble gases were released for sure when the fuel began to crack. This is two or three to 12 hours after the accident. Now, if you remember your chemistry, noble gases don't react with anything. This is xenon and krypton. You'll also remember that xenon is, um, is used medicinally. One, I think it's xenon-133 is used as a radioisotope. It's fat-soluble and absorbed in your body. Now, we know for sure that three, five times Chernobyl's releases of noble gases uh, definitely have been measured. There's good scientific papers that show that from the noble gases, three to five times Chernobyl were released. To the northeast of the reactor, we know that the um, noble gas concentrations were something on the order of 1,000 disintegrations per second in a cubic meter of air. Well, the next one is iodine. There are uh, lots of questions about how much iodine was released because iodine does react chemically with the uh, components in the building. But we're certain that iodine was picked up worldwide from the event and uh, even nuclear reactors here in the States were picking it up within uh, several days of the, uh, of the beginning of the accident. The plant released iodine. The question is how much, and I'll get to that later. I'm sure you've also seen um, cesium numbers. That's the easiest isotope to measure. It doesn't mean there's not many other isotopes present, but the cesium concentrations in the soil are the easiest ones to measure. And lastly, you have heavy isotopes like plutonium, and those have also been detected as far as 50 kilometers away from the reactor. Now, one definite similarity between Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima is the fact that there have been government cover-ups of the radiation that's been released. At Chernobyl, researchers were intimidated and, in fact, arrested and thrown in jail for as long as three to five years because they tried to investigate the releases. I have friends who've tried to go into Belarus even now, and uh, 
they're refused access when they realize that their purpose is to research the, the accident. At Chernobyl, we know the demographic data was missing and in some cases deliberately destroyed. At Three Mile Island, we know that the demographic data was never applied. As a matter of fact, the federal judge on the, on the case limited the scientific analysis and told the researchers that if they came up with too high a number, she wasn't going to believe it. So we've got definite government cover-ups at Chernobyl, and I refer you to an excellent book called Chernobyl, Consequences of a Catastrophe. And it's by Alexei Yablokov and others, and it was published by the New York Academy of Sciences. It used to be on sale for 150 bucks a copy, but because many people are very interested in getting the book out, the cost has been reduced to $15. It's an excellent piece of work, hundreds of pages of peer-reviewed analysis. And if you can't find it on the web for something on the order of $15, if you contact Fairwinds on the uh, contact page, we can get you copies or get you in touch with one. So we're also aware that the Japanese are attempting to minimize the consequences of the accident as well. So government reaction to all three accidents has been to minimize the consequences and also try to marginalize the scientists who are doing the work. So how bad was the Fukushima accident? The secret is in the assumptions. Everybody can do the math, but the question is what assumptions went into the math? And the key is in the assumptions. So what really are the public health consequences? There's about a half a dozen different assumptions that need to be factored in. And when I watch the industry, as they have been uh, over the last five or six days, it's clear that they are trying to minimize each and every one of these assumptions. First assumption is how much radiation was available to be released? Well, as I've already said, there was three operating reactors compared to one at Chernobyl. Plus, we had seven nuclear reactor cores in fuel pools that were uncooled as well. So potentially, there's as much as 10 nuclear reactor cores available to be released. What were the timings of the release? Chernobyl failed almost immediately, but it was only at 7% power when it did fail. Fukushima units 1, 2, and 3 failed in 12 to uh, 36 hours, but they were running at 100% power when the uh, accident occurred. So releases could be significantly larger from Fukushima. Pretty convincingly determined that three to five times uh, Chernobyl gases were released as noble gases, and so therefore that tells us that essentially every piece of fuel failed inside of the three operating reactors, and perhaps additional fuel failed in the fuel pools. What was the timing of the releases? No one knows because there was no radiation detectors present. But again, this is a number that's subject to assumption. If you assume the predominant releases occurred when the wind was blowing inland, you'll get one number. If you assume the wind was when the wind blows out to sea, you'll get another number. So the timing of the releases in coordination with the meteorology can produce in dramatically different calculations of the exposure to people within Japan. The next one down, decontamination. What that means is that there's water underneath a nuclear reactor. And for the last 20 years, the Nuclear, Regulation, Nuclear Regulatory Commission has assumed that 99% of the cesium gets trapped in that water. Well, there's a problem there because after Fukushima, that water boiled because it had no cooling water, getting back to the loss of the ultimate heat sink I talked about earlier. The NRC has also said that if the water boils, no cesium will be held up in the water and all of it is subject to be released. So the question is, what are the, um, are the various people calculating doses assuming for the um, decontamination factor for cesium? I've seen the Japanese assume that 99% was retained. There's an Australian study out, though, that shows that 90% that was retained. That doesn't sound like a lot. It's, in fact, 10 times more cesium the Australians are assuming than are the Japanese. So what that number is is a, is a critical piece of analysis that um, I found that the nuclear industry and the Japanese are consistently trying to downplay.
What was the meteorology like on the, on the day of the event? If there's good news in the Fukushima disaster, and I don't think good news and disaster really belong together, but if there's good news, it's that most of the time the wind was blowing out to sea. Now, at Chernobyl, the, the reactor was surrounded by, by people, and surrounded by farmland, and surrounded by cities. Here, at least half of the, uh, the, the compass was, was the ocean, and this accident would have cut Japan in half already, were it not for the fact that the wind was blowing out to sea. Now, there's other pieces. Of course, the uh, Fukushima prefecture and the, has mountains immediately to the west. And those mountains um, prevented a lot of radiation from reaching the west coast of Japan. But now we've got contaminated forests that can essentially never be decontaminated. In the next several months, you're going to hear about contaminated cedar. And as the pollen is released this year from the cedar trees, we'll have an enormous amount of cesium being revolatilized into the atmosphere. So the Fukushima accident isn't over. The cesium is being re-released by Mother Nature. Also, the cesium is being washed into rivers, and the rivers, of course, are um, heading toward the ocean. But we're seeing contamination in freshwater fish as well as ocean fish as a result of all the runoff through the mountain ranges in the Fukushima prefecture. We're also seeing large cesium deposits in the uh, bottom soil on the uh, on the bottom of riverbeds, and of course that gets picked up by by weeds and, and and seaweed in the ocean, that then get eaten by other fish and and mollusks and work their way up the food chain. So we're seeing cesium concentrate in riverbeds. This is not a problem that's going to go away in the next um, in the next year. We're looking at a at a long term problem of, of cesium contamination. I was in, uh, in Tokyo uh, two weeks ago, and I just randomly picked five sample locations as I was um, in the city and put them in bags, brought them back, cleared them through customs, and sent them to the lab. And each one of those bags has contamination levels of dirt that would be qualified as nuclear waste and buried in Texas here in the United States. But the people in Tokyo more than 200 kilometers away, are essentially walking on radioactive waste every day. So as doctors, we've got a, you, you've got a public health issue throughout northern Japan from this chronic exposure to low-level radiation, and you've got a personal health issue for the people in Fukushima Prefecture who have been exposed to well over 10 from the accident. So which was worse, the Fukushima accident or the Chernobyl accident? They were both awful. I noticed that uh, in reading Mikolai Gorbachev's memoirs, he credits Chernobyl, not perestroika, but Chernobyl, with causing the downfall of the Soviet Union. And of course, I'm sure you've also heard in the last two weeks that Tokyo was almost evacuated as a result of, this, uh, of the Fukushima accident. Even today, if there's a significant earthquake and, and one of the fuel pools collapses at Fukushima, Japan still could be cut in half. So which is worse? I go back to the first line. They were both awful. We're talking about a technology that has the capability to destroy a nation. There's a long-term cleanup effort that's going to be required by the Japanese. I don't believe the Japanese have recognized the severity of the problem yet. They seem to be nickel-diming it and spending, you know, a billion here and a billion there. But in fact, the total cost of this cleanup is now estimated to be 500 billion. That's a half a trillion dollars U.S. to clean up the site and the surrounding prefectures. Now, nuclear experts on television have been saying, well, the accident was bad, but we we're never going to find any injuries. I disagree. Uh, when I look at the use of their assumptions, uh, I can find error after error that make them non-conservative. 
This is Radio EcoShock. You are listening to a presentation by nuclear engineer Arnold Gunderson at the Vancouver Conference, The Fukushima Nuclear Disaster, One Year Later. In fact, I believe that over the next 20 years, we're going to see about a million additional cancers and other health problems as a result of the accident. That's quite a broad span from zero with nuclear experts uh, paid for by the industry to a million by me and other independent scientists. Only time will tell, and frankly, I hope I'm wrong, but I'm quite sure I'm not. Now, I get that number from the Three Mile Island accident. People did die after Three Mile Island. There was a, um, as, as a result of the trial, uh, Judge Rambo authorized a study. The study showed that there were extra cancer deaths from Three Mile Island. Now, Three Mile Island was a thousand times smaller than Fukushima, and yet we determined there were extra cancer deaths after Three Mile Island. Now, the judge said, well, yeah, but because the releases were so low, I don't believe that. Well, Dr. Stephen Wing published a peer-reviewed paper, and that's also on our website, the Fairwinds website, where he shows that clearly uh, there's an, uh, at least a 10 to 20% increase in lung cancers for people that were exposed in the first 10 days of the accident. So based on Three Mile Island, which was 1,000 to 100,000 times smaller than Fukushima, I believe it's reasonable that we'll have as many as a million additional cancers after, after Fukushima. The other parts of the problem are uh, systemic within Japan. Japan is dispersing the contamination with incineration. Now, what they're doing as an example, in a school near Tokyo, uh, they found some highly contaminated material. And rather than dispose of that as high-level waste, they diluted it 1,000 to 1 with clean material and put it in incinerators and then took that 1,000 times more ash and poured it into Tokyo Bay. So they believe that dilution is the solution to pollution. And in fact, what they're doing is they're putting cesium in the soil that will be enormously more expensive to remove later. I think the reason is that the, the Japanese are protecting Tokyo Electric's financial short-term interests comparing to protecting the long-term interests of their own population. Japan does have an alternative. They can go with the technology of the 21st century, which is distributed generation, smart grids, and renewables, vehicle-to-grid technology called V2G technology in the 20th century. We didn't have computers in the systems we've got now to integrate a grid. But now in the 21st century, we can distribute our generation. And these distributed smart grids will be the way of the 21st century. So Japan's got a chance. Japan can be an economic powerhouse, and it can export this new technology, or it can go back into the central station paradigm of the 20th century. What I took away from the Fukushima accident is that it's impossible to predict the worst event that Mother Nature or humans in the form of terrorists can do to a nuclear power plant. The other piece is that nuclear power, when things go wrong, which isn't very frequently, but when things go wrong, it's a technology that can destroy a nation. It can destroy it financially or environmentally. So for those two reasons, we've got a, a, a high risk but low probability technology, but that no one can anticipate the worst Mother Nature can throw at us. In the States, it can be a dam break. In Canada, it can be flooding, or it could be severe storms that knock out power. On and on. There are things we have not anticipated when we build these plants so my recommendation is over the next 20 or 30 years, let's phase them all out and go with smart grids and distributed generation. I think the future in the 21st century is bright and it can be achieved with an organized phase out of nuclear power. That was Arnold Gunderson from the consulting company Fairwinds. The title is The Fukushima Disaster and Its Aftermath and Comparisons to Chernobyl. This was recorded March 11, 2012 in Vancouver, Canada by Alex Smith of Radio Eco Shock. 
The conference was organized by Physicians for Global Survival, Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility, Simon Fraser University, and other medical organizations in British Columbia. Find more recordings from the conference at ecoshock.org. Discover a series of helpful videos on Fukushima at the Gunderson's website, fairwinds.com. That is fair, the letter E, wins.com. <laughs>